for joining us today. Uh, we have a great guest to bring you on our uh, the Host Broker webinar series here. Uh, today, we are talking about SBA loans. Um, and this is a, a topic that we get asked about a lot from um, from our, our buyers. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's top of mind for a lot of buyers who are looking for good financing options in the United States. Um, and admittedly, you know, this is not an area of expertise for us. So, so we brought on a true expert today um, in, in Nick Padlow from Live Oak. Um, and I'll give Nick an opportunity here to introduce himself. Uh, but, uh, you know, just to start off, you know, I'm, my name's Devin Rose. I'm an associate the host broker. Um, and the host broker, we are a brokerage for uh, IT service providers, including MSPs, web hosts, data centers, and other IT service companies. Uh, we were founded by Heartland Ross, who is also on the call with us today. And um, if you're interested in reaching out uh, for a free evaluation, you can go to thehostbroker.com. And uh, then we have uh, Nick Padlow from, from Live Oak. Um, Nick is a senior loan officer for MSP financing at Live Oak. Uh, he spent the past decades in banking and financial services and has a, a ton of experience doing MS, uh, m and financing for MSPs. Nick graduated from uh, St. Bonaventure University in Western New York and uh, lives in Wilmington, North Carolina, where Live Oak is headquartered. Uh, Nick, do you want to uh, just tell us a little bit more about yourself or uh, about Live Oak before we get into the discussion today? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Devin uh, and Heartland for having me on today. It's uh, it's great, and I, I think we're going to have some really good discussions about, you know, SBA financing, a little bit about MSP specifically, you know, and how that kind of conjuncts with SBA financing and and the like. Um, but yeah, you know, Live Oak is is a really special, you know, bank to work for. So we we not only lend to MSPs, we kind of lend to a number of different verticals. And so that makes us a little bit different from some other banks in the country. So when when you contact us, you know, whether it's for an MSP loan, a healthcare loan, uh, an investment advisory loan, what have you, um, really the entire team kind of top to bottom. So, you know, loan officers all the way to um, loan analysts are really specifically working just in that field. And so the nice part about that is it doesn't take you know, weeks or even months to kind of explain to us what, you know, specifically in this case, what MSPs do and how they operate and how they're profitable and, and how they work and how they're, you know, really, uh, you know, nice services to use for, you know, other SMBs. Um, you know, we kind of know enough. We're not by any means, you know, true operational experts, but we know enough from the financing side to, um, you know, to really help people get through um, M&A, uh, you know, activity pretty quickly. So bank was formed in 2008, really just starting to uh, lend just to veterinarians. Uh, and ever since then, you know, the bank has, has grown and, and now is in about 50 different industries. So uh, again, I really appreciate you guys having me on and looking forward to the discussions. Well, thanks, Nick. And I, I certainly can uh, echo the the sentiment there around not having not having MSBs need to explain what they do because it's certainly an industry that um, you know some people just aren't familiar with, and uh, there's intricacies that uh, you know your expertise and at Live Oak, I'm sure, will bring a lot of value to our MSPs who are who are listening to the webinar today. Um, Nick, I was just going to say. Um, you know, we, we it's, it's been a little bit because we've been working with you guys, um, and so I haven't had these types of comments. But I've certainly heard over the years a number of times where someone has spoken with an advisor of one sort at a bank, and they they just didn't. You know, we do a lot of work in the hosting space as well, and they just don't understand these these industries. And so, although technically they have the ability to to uh, make decisions or or process the the, the necessary applications for the loan. They just can't wrap their head around some of the the, the, the kind of the recurring nature uh, of the businesses, the the, the lack of uh, you know, for instance, like inventory or something else that they, that's just not um, applicable to uh, to the MSP space. So mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, the fact that you guys um, specialize, in, or I shouldn't say live oak, but but you know, someone like you on uh, um, at least appreciates. The, the nuanced aspects of, of, of IT services, how money is made, uh, wh where uh, where the you know potential uh, flags are um, with uh, with some of the structures of, of, of some of the businesses. So yeah, I just want to add that point. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I think just a little blurb on that too is, you know, most, you know, you think of a traditional bank, right? You think about residential lending, you know, most, <clears throat> most of the time you're going to get a loan, you know, kind of based on the value of whatever you're buying, right? Loan to value for, you know, let's the, the home for that example. Um, you know, so for us and, and especially using a product like the SBA product, we're really more so um, reliant on the cash flow of the business to repay the debt that's associated with it. So, you know, nine times out of 10, maybe 99 times out of 100 would be a little bit better of a metric. Um, you know, th these MSPs, especially in an M&A, um, you know, kind of scenario, there, there's really no tangible collateral going on. You know, you're, you're really buying just the goodwill of the business assets. And so if you don't understand the space that you're lending in, in this case, obviously being MSPs, and you don't really understand, you know, the impacts that it has to other SMBs, then it's hard to kind of wrap your head around, you know, how can we do a $5 million, you know, uh, purchase for, you know, an MSP. Um, but with us, you know, if we understand, you know, there's the right amount of, of revenue breakdown be between, you know, recurring and, and hardware and software sales, um, you know, there's, there's a minimal amount of transition risk between, you know, the seller and the buyer going on. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, ideally, you know, one to three year contracts in place, then we can kind of, you know, overall understand and, and like the space enough to, again, not be really so concerned about the collateral that's being, you know, involved with the loan, but more so the cash flow of that business to repay that debt. So I think that's just a little bit of the nuance of, um, you know, kind of what you see with some banks versus some that are specialized in the space. Yeah. Great. Very, very helpful. Um, so let's just start off with the with the basics here. Our first discussion question here is just what are SBA loans? Do you mind just giving us an overview? Yeah, I mean, I'll try to keep it in its simplest terms. I would I would say that an SBA loan is really, um, you know, it's a it's a tool to help put capital in the hands of small business owners throughout the United States. So um, there is a Condu, you know, there's a whole kind of mixture of different types of SBA products. There's a 504, all kind of different, you know, working capital lines, um, you know, you name it. What we typically see for MSP owners, again, with really there not being a lot of real estate involved in these transactions, um, is we typically see the SBA 7A loan that's used. So uh, a little bit about why banks use it, you know, it's candidly, it's not just specific to Live Oak. So um, really, any bank can apply to be a preferred lender to have what's called PLP status. Um, what that kind of means is that you as a bank, if you have that status, you don't have to send the package off to the actual SBA to get approved. Uh, as long as you're doing everything under the SBA's SOP, you can kind of underwrite, you know, approve and close loans in-house and, and fund those loans. Um, Nick, Nick, just what, what's the advantage to the, I mean, I, I know the answer, but just for those who don't know, what, what's the difference? Because I've often talked to people about ensuring that they do find out if they're, oh, I've got a, you know, I've got a bank already that I deal with. Um, and I say, find out if they're a, a preferred lender. So can you just, yeah. what, what's the benefit of that? Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. That was kind of, you know, kind of where I was, where I was leading into a little bit. So that's a great question. Um, when you're working with a preferred lender over somebody who's not a preferred lender, uh, you know, the biggest thing is time. So I would say if we, you know, if we were working with you on a acquisition, let's say, um, we would probably be able to close that loan, you know, start to finish within roughly, you know, 30 to 45 days if you're talking underwriting through closing. Um, candidly, if you're working with a non-delegated lender, so a, a lender who does not have that PLP status, it could potentially take just that amount of time once it gets to the S SBA's hands, even for them to to review it and then give some feedback. So you're talking about <clears throat> potentially, you know, six months kind of start to finish with a non-delegated lender versus, you know, like I said, anywhere from 30 to 45 days with somebody who, you know, doesn't have to go to the SBA for loan approval. So it, it really is. Um, you know, a big resource to kind of work with somebody who does not have to send the actual package to the SBA for approval. Great, thanks. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, another point too, um, you know, with SBA loans is, you know, there's obviously conventional finance, financing out there as well. So even though, uh, you know, Live Oak in this case, even though we're not the number one, I'm sorry, even though we are the number one SBA lender, but not, um, you know, we, we're not necessarily pigeonholing people into these products, right? So we, we go ahead and kind of talk through what the pros and cons are. Um, you know, for any product. And then we kind of, you know, go ahead and take that, you know, tailored package and maybe provide a couple of different solutions. But one thing to really know about the SBA is that, you know, it is government backed, right? So for the bank, if we make a million dollar loan today, and, and again, it's not quite this easy, but I'll, I'll just put it in layman's terms. Um, if we if we did a million dollar loan today and that loan went bad tomorrow, then the, the government backs up that loan by 75%. So we would go through the, you know, liquidation process and then we would get, you know, $750,000 back of that, um, you know, of that million. So that allows us to get a little bit more flexible in terms of uh, the type of cash flow that we're, that we're seeing, uh, you know, the, the personal liquidity of somebody's balance sheet that we're seeing, um, you know, and, and along with that mixed with, you know, the fact that these SBA loans really do have some really nice features that make it a little bit more attractive in terms of, you know, money down and amortization um, and the fact that there's no, you know, covenants or balloon payments. It, it overall for most small business lenders make or small business owners makes it uh, very attractive. You know, on the on the conventional side, we can really do the same thing. But given the fact that it's not backed up by the government and it's really backed up just by, <clears throat> you know, really Live Oaks assets, um, you know, we are are going to be a little bit more uh, cautious, I should say, in terms of the the amortization that we could give or, you know, are we going to have to structure a balloon payment in or are there debt service coverage ratio requirements uh, that we're going to have to, you know, turn into covenants for the loan? So. Those are those are kind of some some key differences between SBA lending and, and conventional. SBA loans are going to have longer terms, typically less money required for the down payment, um, no covenants, and no balloons. Makes sense. That's a that's a helpful overview for kind of why they'd be a, a preferred uh, option for for a lot of uh, buyers. Um, so let's. Um, Let's touch a little bit on the next discussion point here, which is who are SBA loans meant for? Yeah, yeah. So kind of that kind of uh, you know ties in a little bit with with where I was going in the in the first question. I would say, you know, really they're meant for for anyone who owns a small business uh, in the U.S. So, you know, depending on your NAICS code, so that's kind of the government code that's uh, associated with your business. There's you know tons of them. You can typically see them on your tax returns. Uh, in the upper left-hand side, um, but depending on your your overall size uh, of your business, you know that if you're too large, depending on the NAICS code that you're in, you know you could be automatically kind of disqualified for SBA lending. But I would say most of the customers that we deal with are really of that size to where they can you know go ahead and and qualify for an SBA loan. So uh, another way of you know, answering that is, is really, they're kind of meant for anybody and everybody. Um, you know, when we, when we think about, you know, qualifying somebody, again, there's, there's a lot of different, you know, scenarios you guys have probably, you, you know, might have some scenarios that you want to bring up, you know, for context, but um, SBA loans, I, I would say are, are number one kind of great for, you know, let's, let's specifically talk about the MSP space, obviously, since we're here for that. Um, you know, let's say you're an engineer and you've been working with an MSP or, or for an MSP for a long time, or e even in a just overall kind of IT adjacent type, you know, industry. And you're like, well, I'd really love to, you know, get into the MSP space as an owner, but, you know, I have, maybe I have a couple hundred thousand dollars to, in liquidity to put down, but, you know, nothing, nothing in, in, you know, some people's terms, uh, you know, crazy to, to come in with. Um, SBA financing is great because you can, you know, go from being a W-2 employee to an owner, you know, using an SBA loan for your first time acquisition. A lot of people kind of automatically, and you guys have probably seen this, uh, I think a lot of people automatically disqualify themselves if they don't have, you know, millions of dollars of liquidity, you know, in the bank. They think, oh, there's no way I can buy, <clears throat> you know, a three to $5 million, you know, purchase price MSP. But, um, what the SBA does ask for is a standard 10% down payment 
for an S for an SBA loan. So that would be 10% kind of of your overall project cost. So the size limit for an SBA loan is is five million dollars. So and and uh, and I'll get to to another part in a second here. You you can technically go over the five million dollar cap if you don't have any existing SBA debt. And let's say you have a $8 million purchase price. If you have no SBA debt outstanding, you could technically get a uh, what's called an SBA paired with a conventional loan, which which would be a Perry Pursue loan. And that could get you over and above the $5 million cap, you know, in one shot. But again, let's let's just talk about the $5 million cap because that's what most people are are kind of familiar with. So, you know, coming in with 10% of 500000 uh, or, I'm sorry, five million, which would be five hundred thousand, can seem seem a little bit daunting. Uh, however, you you don't need to come in with a hundred percent of that in cash, you know, for your down payment. There are some options where the seller can carry, you know, a note either on full standby or partial standby to kind of help with that. Um, you know, you can if you, let's say you have a home equity line of credit or somebody wants to gift you some money and sign a gift letter. Uh, we can count that as equity as well. So there's a lot of creative ways to kind of bridge the gap um, for these down payments that, I, again, I think some people just based on my experience, you know, they just automatically go into looking at an opportunity and saying, hey, there's there's no way that a bank's going to lend me that. You know, I don't I don't have, you know, a million to two million bucks just sitting in the in the bank, you know, cash on hand. Nick, I got two questions for you. One of the other advantages that I understood, and, and please clarify if this is not the case, but that aside from all the reasons that you said that an SBA loan would be advantageous, um, the interest rate is also uh, more compelling than traditional um, loans might be. Is that, is that a fair statement or does it depend? Yeah, it kind of depends. I, I think you know interest rates are always going to be dependent on who you, um, you know, the bank that you work with. You know, some some banks might say, and again, this could be their business model is like, is hey, you know, we we will give you a, a haircut on on an interest rate going SBA versus conventional. Um, that to me kind of comes off like you're you might be steering somebody towards a product. So, uh, candidly, for us, you know, we really are when we're talking about interest rates, we're really looking at it more from a, a risk based standpoint. So transparently, you know, the the stronger that the applicant is, the stronger that the business is, um, and really just the overall ancillary components of the deal, you know, the, the stronger that those components are, you know, typically the stronger our pricing is going to be. Right. Um, you know, we we definitely are not, you know, and I think a lot of MSP owners, you know, can kind of resonate with this. You know, there's probably bigger companies out there that offer similar solutions to them that might be charging less just because they have, you know, a bigger platform. So Anytime we're talking about pricing from our standpoint, you know, I, I always tell people, you know, we're not going to be probably the lowest rate in their land. You know, we're, we're not going to be the highest. Um, really, our value proposition is not only the interest rate, but really the service that's associated with it. You know, from day one, understanding your business, being able to get you a term sheet that actually, you know, means something that carries weight, being able to get you through the closing process, having M&A, you know, true M&A experience to kind of guide you through the process along with your actual broker um, and get you to a closed loan. So there, there's a lot, there's a lot of context, I think, that needs to be talked about when people bring up interest rates, because a lot of people just think, well, if I have bank A and bank B and bank A has a lower interest rate, I should go with bank A. Well, you have to say, well, do they know the space? Do they, you know, what's their track record of, you know, getting to close loans? Um, is this just simply a term sheet to kind of lock me in and then change conditions later, which, you know, unfortunately does happen in banking. So um, yeah. hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, I know that's good. And I guess also the going back to the preferred lender status as well. I mean, if they are going to go to an SBA route, but but one bank is offering um, um, a, a you know slightly higher rate, but like you guys, if that was you, um, but you are a preferred lender versus somebody else, there's a compelling argument there too. Um, yeah. So the other the other thing I was just going to ask here is um, that uh, I think it's no secret to most uh, of our um, listeners and those who are on our mailing list, but um, for for uh, you know IT companies for sale that we publish every week. Uh, but we're in Canada, and uh, we do most of our business uh, in the United States um, with with both buyers and sellers, uh, but but not exclusively. And there are uh, many times over the years there 
where we've had a business in Canada for sale that a U.S. firm is interested in acquiring. Um, the question I have is that you've referenced several times that the SBA loan is for uh, U.S. Um, citizens, and uh, uh, that's fairly well understood. But what about the the ultimate um, purpose of the loan, and can that that loan be used to to finance a, a business that may be in Canada or maybe in Europe or or whatnot? It doesn't apply so much for MSPs in the sense of Europe. Europe, but I know we've done a ton of hosting deals over the years where an American company will buy a UK uh, you know business, for instance. So and also, and then you know, frankly, Canada would be the 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 top outside of the United States, yeah. so Americans would invest um, for for, for um, an, uh, an acquisition. So I just wonder what your thoughts were there. Yeah, I, I would say that this one it's it's so case by case that I, that I'll be a little bit high level and just say, you know, <clears throat> we, we'd love to talk with anybody in that situation, um, you know, specifically because there there's a lot to dive into. There's um, you know understanding. You know, even though the company might be based out of Canada, you know, what's going to be kind of the post-closing, you know, transition look of that business, you know, is, is, are the business assets going to be tied to a U.S. based entity? You know, what kind of, where, where do the customers, where are they located? Are they, they mainly, you know, outside of the U.S.? Are they within the U.S.? You know, right. um, th- so there's a lot of different things to talk about there. I, I would say, you know, because given the fact that it is, you know, obviously IT, it, it throws that wrinkle in there. Um, you know, for other industries, it's a little bit more black and white. You know, I, my prior experience to this, I spent a lot of time in our uh, funeral home division. So for us to help a U.S.-based funeral home operation buy a, you know, funeral home in Canada, obviously pretty black and white, you know, can't can't do that. Um, but yeah, there, there's always, I, I always say with, with this question that, you know, let's go ahead and talk through the opportunity before we set too many expectations. Make, makes sense. Okay. No, good. Thanks for, for clarifying. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I actually didn't think that that was possible, but I, I can see, uh, especially for hosting where we used to, you know, um, uh, see a lot of uh, uh, deals where the, he has a Canadian company, but like half the customer base was in the U.S. and, and they may even have, uh, you know, the customers that were in a U.S. data center and so forth. So I could see how, um, and we see that with MSP sometimes as well, um, where, where there's U.S. customer base. So it's, it's uh, location is kind of becoming more and more irrelevant for this type of a business. Obviously, yeah. it's a veterinary business, as you said earlier, or a funeral home business. So it's a different story. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And just to follow up on, on that, too, um, you know, I think it's obvious for that. SBA loans are meant for American citizens, but it, how about like you know, people who are you know, permanent residents or you know uh, citizens of other countries or who are just in the United States, you know, uh, temporarily? Or like, it, does it have to be a, a citizen to to qualify for an SBA loan? Yeah, so there's a there's a question on our on our forms that you know ba- basically you know it asks for any kind of alien ID card. You know, if you're if you're not you know. A U.S. citizen today, but you might be, you know, seeking citizenship. So, um, we we are able to offer financing to those who, um, you know, at least have kind of that permanent re- um, alien residence, you know, status within the U.S., which is which is another nice feature. Good to know. And um, <laughs> what one more thing that I could touch on just real quick, I think it's important, uh, especially for those of you who you know own an MSP today, is one very attractive thing about the SBA is that we talked about 10%, you know, kind of being the standard down payment for somebody who doesn't own uh, an MSP today. But if you do own one and you're looking to buy another, and really this is for any industry, but if you're an MSP that's looking to buy another MSP, uh, you could qualify for up to 100% financing. So no money down. It would be called an SBA, uh, SBA acquisition expansion. So um, cash flow would still have to be met, you know, our, our debt service coverage ratios um, for us, are, we'd like to see, you know, 1.25 or, or above, <clears throat> you know, with, with a lot of the other ancillary metrics kind of hit. So that's all kind of depending on the cash flow of the business. But we have done plenty of deals, you know, where people are looking to keep as much capital on hand, you know, to deploy for, you know, future acquisitions. And if they can, they, they sometimes do take advantage of, you know, hundred percent financing. So, um, you know, a lot of people will use the SBA to kind of get their foot in the door and into ownership. They'll do a few more SBA loans, you know, for different acquisitions. And then they'll kind of, 
you know, grow beyond the SBA and start looking into conventional financing as well. And then, you know, maybe one day get big enough to where they, you know, partner with a private equity group or sell off or, or what have you. So um, just another piece I wanted to throw in there. Well, thanks for that. Um, yeah. So the next, the next question here is, you know, just about the SBA application process. Do you mind just elaborating a little bit about what that process is like, when information is needed, how long does it take? You touched on this a little bit already, but maybe we could get a little bit more into the details on this one. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll kind of go just start to finish, um, you know, briefly and, and then try to throw in any um, any kind of different commentary that I can you know, on, on the specific pieces, but, um, you know, really day one at like, let's pretending that this was a lead call, you know, with you guys applying today for, for a loan, I, I would go ahead and immediately send you, you know, the overall needs list that we need for underwriting. Right. So that's personal information, business information. Um, what I always do is I highlight the things that are most important first. So ideally we get a, what's called a personal information form filled out, uh, that obviously, <clears throat> you know, gives us the pertinent personal information form on you. Um, that way we can we can pull credit and kind of understand your background, little history, make sure there's no prior bankruptcies, you know, criminal activity, things like that. Um, we then, uh, I go ahead and highlight the personal financial statement. So that's obviously important for me to, you know, gauge uh, what what kind of assets that you you might be um, you know, able to work with in terms of, you know, your down payment and potential collateral to pledge. Uh, a note on that is that some people have, again, kind of what I was talking about earlier, automatically think that if they don't show, you know, tons and tons of liquidity that they're automatically disqualified. So I always tell people, you know, we just like to have the PFS, the personal financial statement filled out in the early part of the process. That way I can really tailor this loan, you know, towards what you have available. Um, and then outside of those two pieces of information, really the the bulk of, of what we're looking at, and I, I spoke to this earlier as well, is we'd be looking to get, you know, assuming that this was an acquisition scenario, uh, we'd be looking to get the uh, pertinent financial information on the target business. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're looking to buy an MSP and this would be your first business purchase, then it would be the target information on just that um, you know, just that MSP being acquired. So past three years of tax returns, you know, most up-to-date profit and loss statement and balance sheet from this year. Uh, if you also had an MSP and you were looking to buy another MSP, we would ask for that same information on your business as well. And then really with, with that kind of, you know, bulk information, I can do, you know, within a few days, depending on workload, I can I can put together a cash flow analysis, you know, based on the potential purchase price that you think the business might be going for. And we definitely are very careful when we talk about this process. We're we're not doing a valuation. We are strictly doing a uh, an income statement kind of year by year cash flow analysis, you know, for that business. And and the reason that it's a cash flow analysis and not evaluation is typically evaluation is kind of done for an overall kind of broader market purpose with an with a, a cash flow analysis it really tailors that analysis to not only to the business that's uh, the subject target but it also tailors it to you know that person and what they're able to come in with so uh, if we're looking at one MSP for multiple buyers you know the structure might look different for buyer a than it does for buyer B because let's say buyer A says, well, I'm going to buy this for a little bit of a premium because I really like the business. It's got a high amount of monthly recurring revenue. There's no real customer concentration. Um, because of that, I want to offer a, you know, a six, six and a half, seven times multiple. And I know that that's a little bit high for the market. So I want to come in with, instead of the 10% 10, 10 down payment, I'm planning on coming in with 25%. And I'm also going to ask the seller to hold back a note as well. So that could be different than buyer B who might not have as much liquidity or who might not have as much pull with the, with the owner to, you know, hold back a note. So um, that's just a little bit of context on kind of what we're looking for in the beginning and what, what a cash flow analysis is versus a, a business valuation. So really once we get through that, um, you know, let's just say that the cash flow looks good and, you know, whatever purchase price you're thinking of offering kind of matches up to the cash flow analysis and our debt service coverage marks are hit. Really from there, the rest of the process would just 
really be filling out the rest of the information that I would need to get you into underwriting. Most of those documents are pretty basic. There, there is an M and A kind of questionnaire that will ask some different, you know, um, just kind of generalized questions about that business. Um, a letter of intent, if if you have one. Uh, if not, maybe at least a, a ballpark kind of you know uh, draft of that letter of intent is typically nice to have. But once I have all of the application information. Uh, I'm then able to give out a proposal. This is a little bit different than some banks. You know, some banks might really just have a conversation and maybe look at a year or or two of uh, internally prepared numbers and then throw out a, a loose term sheet to try to, you know, quote unquote, get the deal off the street. So for us, we're really careful when we propose on something. If I put anything on paper in terms of a proposal, it means that I have a basically a 95 to 100 percent certainty that it's going to go through the process and get approved um i think we're able to to operate like that a little bit differently than some banks because we're not commission-based so i'm not personally kind of incentivized on any one loan that we're that we're doing so we we strike a balance between being um you know fast and efficient as well as you know not trying to over promise and then under under deliver if that makes sense so really it gets us that gets us through you know proposal once once we send out a proposal and if if the borrower likes that proposal and they send back a signed um, proposal letter we go ahead and get the loan into underwriting we typically say for us you know underwriting is anywhere from five to, t to ten business days just depending on the number of entities being underwritten to and the size of the deal uh, from there, it takes about a day to two days to, um, you know, once it's been submitted to our credit team to go ahead and get a, an official yes or no, you know, hoping that it comes back as a yes. Really from there is when I count the true kind of closing timeline and, and we typically schedule about 45 days to close. You know, we've done plenty that have, you know, been less than 45 days. We've done a few, you know, sub 30 days. Uh, everybody was really on the ball with everything. And then we've had a, a few that have drifted out a little bit past that, um, you know, just depending on, on different dynamics. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of a rough, you know, overall kind of start to finish what the application process looks like. We've had uh, one uh, experience with a, uh, a buyer who was using SBA where it the the time frame got extended out because their lender kept asking for more materials rather than like asking for everything at, at, up front yeah. it, 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 to be honest it was quite painful for everyone involved and ended up you know being extended out to like six months yeah so i, I presume as a you know a preferred uh, lender here and you guys have an experience with with msps in particular you would have some expertise to bring to the table to make sure that doesn't happen, that you get the information you need up front. Is, is that the case? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, the preferred lender status, um, not, not to undersell it, but I don't, I don't want to oversell it either. You know, there's a lot of preferred lenders out there. I, I would say the biggest thing that really separates, you know, any even preferred lender uh, amongst another preferred lender is, Again, kind of going back to, I, I think Live Oak does a great job of, you know, truly, you know, immersing themselves into these industries. And so that mixed with the fact that, again, we're not commission based. I, I'm not in the business of wasting anybody's time like that. You know, I, I go ahead and ask for that pertinent information up front, you know, and we're, we're really good and we pride ourselves in giving a quick indication of a yes or an indication of a no within the first you know, really 24 to 48 hours of, you know, when we receive that package, that kind of initial, you know, bulk information on the front end. So, you know, I, I think that's where, again, if, if people are trying to get a deal off the street, you know, quickly and they didn't quite look into the financials and, you know, they start to kind of see that, you know, the financials are not panning out to what the purchase price was. And now they're trying to buy more time, ask for more information. That's where timelines can really get drug out. And, you know, I always say, you know, time kills deals. So I, I'd rather not be, you know, even if it's one that we have to pass on. I mean, candidly, we, we probably, you know, there's probably some deals out there that I've passed on in the past that, you know, have ended up doing really well. But if I, if I don't feel like early on, um, that it's something that we can do, you know, and, and I'm setting the right expectations early, you know, then I'm, then I'm not going to 
I'm not going to oversell myself and say that we can do that deal. So again, I, I think we try to, you know, to preserve people's time to make sure that everybody understands, you know, that we're, we're, you know, we're here to make sure that uh, we're not over promising and under delivering and that we're, you know, we're basically sticking to our word. Nick, um, just to not to sort of uh, beat a dead horse here, um, and, and but uh, you know a little bit of the the devil's advocate, as Devin said. I mean, we've we've done a number of transactions, not like a tremendous number, but certainly uh, a number of, of transactions where there's an SBO a loan um, uh, behind the deal, and you know the experience has, has first of all the timelines that have been promised to the the buyer. Uh, on behalf of the bank, um, never even came close to to being um, followed through on, and and as Devin said, you know what happens is it goes to um, underwriting, and then underwriting department sort of almost starts from scratch all over again, and mm -hmm. has asked for uh, you know a, a lot, maybe the same information, um, but usually going a lot deeper at that point, and mm -hmm. and 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 usually by that point we're we're already. 60, 90 days into the process. Um, so in fairness, they weren't with Live Oak. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Um, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely, and then of course the challenge is, is that the seller starts to become impatient and yeah. uh, the seller gets nervous. Well, you know, yep. what's really going on here? Is this thing going to get done or not? And, and so, you know, we end up in this precarious position where we've got to kind of talk uh, uh, groups off the ledge and, um, uh, get them to 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 be you know patient, but at the end of the day, you know we don't necessarily have the, the full visibility either. And oftentimes the buyer is going through the process for the first time, not always. Um, but you know I've been told many times that oh we you know we've used an SBA uh, uh, loan before and it, it's taken you know a short period of time. But it just our experience has been that it's been um, far far longer than anybody uh, uh, talks about, and so. Mm -hmm. I guess I was just kind of, I mean, you've commented on, on a lot of reasons why, and it's a little bit difficult because there's a lot of finger pointing, right? Well, the bank says, well, this is new information or yeah. didn't provide us with this. But at the same time, the other flip side is, well, why didn't you ask for that information in the beginning? And maybe it goes back to them not, uh, you know, again, understanding the industry. It's, it's, it's sort of hard to know. Um, but I, I just, I don't know if you have any comments or it's just, it's just you know, it's my comment. You don't even need to say anything, but. No, I mean, I think it goes back to, I, I also won't beat a dead horse and say the same thing again. I'll, I'll kind of say the same thing, with, but with a little bit of context. So because we understand the space, I don't, let, let's just, let's pretend that we didn't, right? And I just said, okay, an MSP is applying for an SBA loan. I generally look at their cash flow. It looks pretty good. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm a commission-based salesperson. I'm looking to get as many deals as I can in underwriting and then be on to the next one. So if we had that approach, you know, it's, that's where I think you see, alone quickly kind of get into underwriting, but then it takes like a month sometimes in underwriting to even get approved because the underwriter yeah. at a lot of places are doing a bulk of the, you know, of the analysis. So here, you know, I'll, I'll just more speak about us. I already kind of know to not just ask for just basic financials. I'm going to ask for, you know, an updated ticketing, ticketing report. I'm going to ask for, you know, a revenue mix to understand the, you know, the MRR and the difference between that and the project based, you know, project based revenue. Um, I'm going to go and ask, head and ask for customer concentration, you know, accounts receiving and, and payable, you know, aging reports, um, cash flow cycle work seats. I mean, it really, all the things that are kind of, you know, generally needed for by any business and then things that are kind of ancillary, you know, to the actual MSP, because as you know, you know, uh, uh, a business that's going for anywhere from four to six times uh, and for a multiple, you know, that might have, you know, one's got a 70% MRR, you know, revenue mix and the other one's got a 30, you know, that could drastically differ, uh, you know, what the, what the revenue kind of cycle looks like, you know, year to year. And I think, when you don't understand the space, especially for MSPs, and it goes to an underwriter and you kind of put all the earnest on them to do all of the true analysis, because they don't really know the space either, they're kind of going back and back and maybe Googling, you know, what does an MSP do? What are the typical margins? And they're asking question after question, you know, after question and kind of, you know, going along like that. Right. So for us, you know, again, we don't know, I'm not going to sit here and say we are true operational experts, but we, we know enough, we've done enough deals in the space to where 
early on, even, even via conversation, I kind of know within my tailored checklist, what else I'm going to maybe ask for. And that way, by the time it gets out of my hands into an underwriter, I'm more so telling that underwriter why it's a good deal. And I'm not saying, Hey, you know, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Underwriter here, here's the deal, you know, let me know, or let us know, including the borrower, if you have any questions, I, I have a little bit more control in my hands on the deal. And, and if they have questions, they'll, they'll typically come to me and I'll say, well, I, I actually already answered this here. Um, and we'll kind of work, work it out amongst each other. It's, it's not to say we're perfect and we never go back and maybe ask for a little bit more info, but uh, rarely do I have the complaint of, well, you know, you, you didn't set the expectation. You're, you're asking for things that should have been asked for day one. I, I would say it's a, it's a rarity. And I, th I think that's why, again, you know, the proof is in the pudding a little bit, you know, Live Oaks, the number one SBA lender uh, by volume. So the most dollars lent, you know, over the past seven years. So you know, again, we're not, we're not perfect. We're, you know, we're like any other bank and we can be a pain at times, but, um, we, we have our, we have our fingers to the pulse, especially with the SBA process, um, on kind of what to ask for, you know, early on and, and not dragging people through what can be a long process. Because regardless of what bank you work with, when you get to that, cl that closing process, they, they call it the great paper chase for a reason. That part's out of our hands. There, there is a lot of documentation on the closing side. So we already know that that part's tough enough. When it comes to the actual financial analysis and getting to you know, a done deal, we want to make that easy. Uh, and again, I can't say it enough. I do believe that the non-commission-based piece is really nice because – Again, we, we, we don't sit that sit back and say, well, I'm not making any commission on this deal, so I'm not going to work hard for the customer. Um, we have overall bank goals that we want to hit, you know, as salespeople, but, you know, I think it helps us um, strike a, a fine line between moving quickly on a deal and also asking the right information, you know, upfront and early and, um, and, and making sure that we can actualize and deliver on whatever we've, you know, told the customer early on in the process. Right. Okay, I have a, a follow up on on uh, some of the information that's requested to you. So, you know, you mentioned you usually request uh, the financials from the last three years. Um, often when we're working with sellers, they're in the position where, you know, they realize they they wanted to sell a while ago and they've started to optimize the business to make it look mm -hmm. more attractive. Um, and But that really varies. I mean, sometimes we have sellers who've been doing that process for several years, in which case it would be captured by the financials in the last, you know, the three years. But sometimes it's, you know, maybe just a few months and uh, and only in, in the current year and not captured in the previous year's financials. And, you know, similarly, sometimes we have MSPs where they've had significant growth in the current year that weren't captured in, in the previous year's financials. So I, I guess the question to you is, how much stock do you put in kind of more recent events uh, that would impact the cash flow? Um, is that something you look at or is it strictly mm -hmm. the kind of the past few years? Yeah, yeah. No, I think, uh, you know, most of these deals um, are represented, you know, typically by a broker, you know, so it's, it's somebody who's gone in, they've maybe put together an operating memorandum or a confidential information memorandum and they've said, Okay, here, you know, going back to, let's say, 2020, <clears throat> you know, here's every every year's operations broken out on the income statement. With some of these adjustments, here's kind of the pro forma look of what it, you know, it could be. And here, and here's what, what we're saying is the, you know, adjusted EBITDA or the seller discretionary earnings. A lot of people use different nomenclature. Um, but, you know, we're, we're depending on the items, we can easily add things back to the cash flow. You know, let, let's say, for for instance, uh, an owner is play, paying a ghost employee. Let's say they have a, a daughter who, you know, might have a, a, a job elsewhere who might not be, you know, who, who maybe is a homemaker, and, but they're they're paying that person, you know, that daughter 50 grand a year out of their business because they have enough money in the business to, to do so. Obviously, that expense is not going to carry forward for a, you know, for a new buyer. So as long as we get the W-2s to match up with that person's salary, you know, individually each year going back to, to two or three years of tax returns, you know, we can add, we can add that person's salary back. Um, if you're running, you know, a high amount of auto, automobile expenses through your, through your MSP, obviously, you know, MSPs don't need to be carrying a fifteen to fifty thousand dollar, you know, auto budget, which I, I have seen those numbers on some tax returns. So we can add th those things back. Um, you know, I, I would say what's a little bit tougher is, 
you know, trying to say, well, you know, the, the business does about a million dollars a year and, you know, um, it's cost of goods sold or about, you know, th- three, you know, or 400,000 or so, but, you know, realistically this, if you put a little bit more effort into it, it could, it could be doing 1.2 million and you could cut your cost down to about 200,000. That, that's a little bit different, right? That's really projection based, you know, operations. So, um, again, if there's, if there's, seller discretionary, you know, earnings that are being taken out of the business, you know, like I said, the ghost employee, um, automobile expenses, really any other expenses that can clearly, you know, be justified to be added back to the cash flow, you know, that aren't going to carry forward for the, for the new buyer, we can take that into consideration, you know, a hundred percent and, and, and often do. Uh, I'd say mo- most of these sellers are not going at this alone, you know, from, uh, uh, from putting this out on the, you know, into the ether and, and in everybody's hands, you know, so most of the time uh, a sales packet again is done that kind of already captures that information and it helps people kind of quickly. I, I would say this, the standard um, is, is, you know, as people are going out and searching for different businesses to buy is that, you know, most of these groups that are putting these businesses out to sale typically give anywhere from a week to about two weeks uh, to, to, you know, make some sort of indication of interest or to put together a rough letter of intent. Um, and more often than not, they're, they're really just going to give that financial information based on adjusted EBITDA, no, no really supporting documentation and say, okay, go ahead and make a bid based on this. And so we always tell our borrowers that we're, we're fine to do that. We just want to set the expectation that everything in that sales packet, in that operating memorandum, in that SIM, every, everything there needs to match up with the historical financials that we, we need to request. And, and, you know, more often than not, they, they do. Makes sense. And and by the way, I'm going to be doing a a different webinar, just myself on the sort of uh, adjustments that are made to calculate that adjustment, adjusted EBITDA figure for MSPs. So uh, if you're interested, check out our YouTube channel. It should be up within a week or two here as well. Yeah, awesome. I'd love to check that out. Um, Okay, so, you know, one other question here is just what restrictions do SBA loans impose on the structure of acquisitions? For instance, no customer carve outs, no earn outs. Um, can, can you touch on this? What, what sort of restrictions are there on the structure of a deal? Yeah, I mean, I, I looked at this one and I mean, you, you really kind of said it, you know, um, the SBA doesn't allow uh, earn outs. You know, you can, you know, a lot of people will kind of fight me on that a little bit and because they just simply can't believe it. I mean, you know, earn outs are a great thing. Obviously, it keeps, you know, the, the seller uh, typically incentivized to help continue to grow the business. Um, the SBA typically, you know, a lot of a lot of old school lenders will talk about, you know, uh, working in the confines of the spirit of the program. That's that's how you know you're you're kind of dealing with a true SBA person is, you know, when they when they start talking about that, that means they've they've probably been doing SBA lending for a long time. So um, I would say one of the, one of the many kind of different pieces of uh, of the SBA program that that captures the spirit of it is they they truly want to allow within their uh, within their program, they want to allow an owner to, you know, hand somebody a check, even if there's seller financing involved, you know, post closing, they are, they are, you know, really the true owner operator of the business. And in some cases, not all cases, um, earnouts can feel a little bit like the, the owner still has, you know, a pretty big say in, in how the business is being operated, because obviously if it's based on future earnings and they feel like they're running a business a certain way to get to that target earnout, um, you know, metric to, to have the, the, uh, metric paid out in full, if they, you know, if there's a clashing of heads between the, the owner and, um, or the existing owner and the, you know, the new owner, then that could potentially, you know, place, you know, bigger problems, you know, for that, uh, that overall transfer of ownership. So that's a little bit on why I think the SBA doesn't like, you know, or, or allow earnouts. They do allow, you know, seller financing though. <clears throat> um, so that, that's a really nice piece, but, um, you know, customer carve outs, again, that kind of goes back to uh, a little bit of what Hartland was asking about with the, you know, purchasing of a business in, in a different, you know, le- like let's say in, in Canada, um, we we are starting to see some deals in this space where people are carving out, you know, a portion of revenue and just selling that off, 
you know, as a business. So again, I'd, I'd say let's continue the conversation there. But really, there's no there's no other major restrictions for SBA financing, you know, other than I would say these earnouts. Maybe the only other thing to to you know kind of say what the black and white SOP says is that you know when you're looking to to purchase a business, that seller can't stay stay part of the business for more than a 12 month transition. I would say is another probably key restriction to talk about. So, you know, again, kind of same thing there. Um, taking off my SBA hat, uh, you know, I, I would say that, you know, it's really nice typically if, if a seller wants to stay in ball for, for a few years, you know, that's great. Um, again, I think it goes back to, they want to, the SBA wants to make sure that banks aren't able to, aren't really allowing sellers to, um, have too much of a hand in the business. And maybe, you know, especially with not all these buyers really knowing who they're dealing with on the sell side until they kind of go through the due diligence process, you know, they might, it, it's kind of protecting people from what they don't know. Um, I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but I've certainly have several people that have, you know, even looked to do a loan with us and they're like, ah, you know, I, I think I just want to do this, you know, hundred percent seller financing. And they come back in a year and they're like, man, my, my seller is just, they're, they're trying, they're not really allowing me to run the business the way that I want to. We're, we're really clashing heads. It's starting to, you know, um, it's starting to hurt the morale of the, you know, um, of the employee base that we have. It's starting to impact our customers a bit. And, you know, this is a nightmare. Can you, can you get me an SBA loan to refinance the seller note? So, um, again, we, we, we always try to, to state the delineation that we are not the SBA. We're, we're obviously just a bank that uses, you know, it's products, but anytime I'm asked to clarify why, why I think the SBA doesn't like earnouts and why they don't like sellers staying involved, I, I typically think it's because of that. Nick, Nick just, just um, uh, on that point, um, if the seller wants to stay on as an employee, mm -hmm. uh, as a salary, but has no strings attached, is that also, does that contravene the 12 month? Period? It can only be... Yeah, it, it really. You're, if the te the technical answer is they can only be a, a contractor, so contractor employee, you know, essentially the same thing. But that transition can only happen for a year. They can only be paid for for that twelve month period. Okay. There was um, when the new SOP came out. The the SOP doesn't get updated every year. It kind of gets updated, you know, depending on what might be going on, you know, with the macroeconomic environment. So it was updated last year in August. And then was put into effect in November <clears throat> so that the first turn of that SOP did have some gray language as it really a lot of the stuff is. There's a lot of gray language, you know, candidly, not to go on a tangent, but um, there's a lot of SBA lenders that might look at one rule and that other the another SBA lender could have an, a completely different interpretation of that rule. It's kind of it's meant to be a little bit tricky at times. Um, but a lot of SBA lenders were reading, uh, you know, the, the section where it talks about. Um, the transition of sellers and the way that it read was that sellers could now stay on for, for more than a 12 month transition, but uh, they have since kind of walked that language back and gone and gone kind of with the traditional, um, you know, 12 month rule. Yeah. Good to know. Um, and just one more uh, question here, and I think we can probably end off to the slide is just what are some of the common pitfalls when applying for an SBA loan that you've seen? Well, I would say it, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about a couple of slides back and just the, the overall process, right? So I, I would say from a sell side, um, you know, if you've been, if for whatever reason your books haven't been necessarily reflecting the true operations of, of you know, of your business over the past few years, um, you know, whether you're running, you know, personal expenses through the business or paying, you know, extra employees or for whatever reason, not capturing, you know, all of the revenue that you really should be, um, you know, it, it's really best advised to go ahead within, some people say three years, I, I say five years, just be conservative. You know, if, if you're even thinking about selling in the next five years, go ahead today and start cleaning up your books, understanding all of your metrics, uh, putting yourself in a buyer's shoes and saying, okay, if I had to step back, take myself out of this business and buy my own business back, you know, what, what do I think about it? You know, from, from a cash flow standpoint, from a revenue mix standpoint, how involved am I as the, as the owner operator? So um, I think that that is a little bit more, you know, seller advisory type commentary, but that can be a pitfall 
when you're when somebody's applying for an SBA loan to purchase your business because again uh, the the majority of the analysis and the weight of the decision is on the cash flow of the business and so you as the seller have really just as much to do with this you know application as as the bar the borrower does. Nick, Nick, I know we're running up against the time here. Uh, just, just one other thing that we've seen, and I'm curious how often you've seen it, and, and you, maybe it's a, a pitfall. But a, a buyer um, is keen on the business. Maybe they've got some uh, become sort of emotionally connected. Like I really want this deal. I want to get mm-hmm. this deal done. Um, they're they're doing they're, they're a, a new a newer buyer. Maybe they've never done a deal. Maybe they've done one other one. Sometimes they you know they bought something very small five years ago, and then this is the kind of the, the second one, but this is at a different level. And uh, so they make an offer. Um, the offer is, is is accepted, and and then um, uh, you guys uh, look at the offer and say, "There's no way we'll do this deal." But there's no way we're going to do it at what you've offered. Uh, right. You've, 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 this is too rich an offer. And so now they need to retrade that, that deal. They need to go back to, to the, the um, they've got a, a signed letter of intent, right? Mm-hmm. You want to see that you've got that. Uh, now they need to go back to the seller or the broker and say, uh, sorry, but you know, I've tried to get financing. I can get it. I just can't get it for one and a half million. They're only going to give me 1.2 million. If you can agree to 1.2 million, then you know, we got it. We got a deal. Um, and, and my experience is generally because because we see this sometimes where we're talking to a seller and, and we're telling them, uh, you know, what they, we think their business is worth ish. We're not you know, for certified uh, evaluators from that perspective, but I've uh, been doing this long enough to have a pretty good idea. And, and they come back saying, oh, geez, well, you know, I got I got twice that. Right. Like I've got a, a guy offering me twice that. And, and my exp- experience is generally that, you know, if something's too good to be true, it probably is. And so you end up with these offers that are just far too high, and then the whole thing falls apart. It falls apart when um, when you guys come in along. It falls apart when they go to their investors and say, "Hey, you know, this is the deal," and the investor starts poking holes in it, um, or or there's or something else happens in, in due diligence. But I'm just curious how often you run into this. Um, yeah, I would say a, a decent bit. You know, I think we we try to pump as much uh, language out there, you know, to get in front of us as soon as possible. You know, a lot of people, uh, I think, are a little bit bashful and they think that they need a full, you know, signed, executed LOI before they come to us. So we just tell everybody, you know, the, the sooner that we can get involved in the deal, the better. You know, candidly, if you're a seasoned owner operator and you've done multiple transactions, then you, you probably... Um, you know, you, you probably rightfully so know what you're doing. You kind of understand the financing metrics you've been through the process before. And, um, you know, you might feel confident enough to go out and get a signed LOI before ever, you know, talking to, to right. a bank. But definitely, if you've never been through the process before, um, there really is no no too early time to, you know, to get a package in front of a lender. If you're looking at like 10 different businesses, I would say maybe narrow it down to, you know, your top couple choices, because obviously that's a lot of different, you know, financials to kind of go through all at the same time. Um, but yeah, it's really just getting your lender involved, you know, understanding the metrics and making sure that you're setting clear expectations. Right. Great. Well, um, thanks so much, Nick. Uh, you know, this was really great having you on today. I, I know I learned a lot. I imagine that uh, our listeners will have learned a lot too. And uh, it's going to be really nice to have a video like this that we can refer people to in the future when they are asking us about SBA loans. Um, if if any of our listeners are interested in getting in contact with the host broker, you can email info at thehostbroker.com. Um, and we have Nick's email address on the slide there too. It's nick.padlo at liveoak.bank. Um, and if you are interested in, in exploring if an SBA loan is right for you, I would highly encourage you to reach out to Nick. Uh, let him know that the host broker sent you and you'll get extra special treatment. And uh, Nick, is there any other place that people can find you online or anything else you'd like to uh, plug before we hop off the webinar today? No, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Again, Nick Padlow uh, on LinkedIn. You know, if you go to Live Oak Bank's website, you know, there's a, a tab that'll take you to um, all of our verticals. It'll say managed service providers. You click on that. There's uh, both my colleague, uh, Angelo Medici, who's the head of the group, uh, and myself as a senior loan officer. So, um, you know, other than that, we're, we're, we're here to answer any questions. And, and guys, we really appreciate the partnership and, and you guys having, you know, me on today. Excellent. Well, Nick, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Uh, All God, right. This was uh, packed full of uh, great information. Yep. Thank you guys both so much. It was great to see you.
Thanks, Nick. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.